I have, in preaching many, many years ago, been in country churches where there was little to no air conditioning, and preaching with every kind of fan and whatever going on, except me. And I've preached and I've felt the sweat squishing in my shoes. And I've resolved that if at all possible, I'm not going to do that anymore. But if it takes it, I'll do it. But it don't seem, doesn't seem that it needs to take it today. But I have seen fit to remove my outer garment. It does help. And if you don't know it, we got an air conditioner problem. One of the units is completely down. So anyway, those of you who are cold-blooded, hard to find good help nowadays. Because it was on. As I was saying, if you're cold-blooded, you ought to be happy. <laughs> But I see the fans moving. My sermon this afternoon is deviating from the study of various denominations, except that it does tie in with the one that is next in our list. If you remember, we were talking about Baptist, <clears throat> the free will Baptist. How are they different from missionary and primitive Baptist? First of all, they're not Calvinist. They're what the denominational people call Armenian. They believe that you can choose and that if you choose to obey, then you'll be saved. And if you uh, don't live the kind of life they think God says Christians are to live, you'll be lost. <clears throat> that is really the big distinguishing difference in them. And how does that fit into the specific point I want to make this afternoon? I'm calling this sermon, In Thine Own Power. In Thine Own Power. But I want to use as a text Genesis 4. Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. We were made free moral agents. That means we have free will. That means we have the power of choice. Now, I don't know whether you give much thought to this, but over the years, it's crossed my mind considerably. I get afraid at the free will that I have. If I go to hell, I choose to go to hell. If I go to heaven, it's because I accept God's way to heaven. And I'm willing to submit to whatever He requires of me in faith and love of Him to be in harmony with it. But I must choose. Joshua said long ago, choose you this day. I had the power of free will. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I want to speak today a little bit, uh, as I said, in thine own power. And I think if you will think seriously about the power that God has given you as a free moral agent, that it ought to be a little frightening because it will make us be more mindful of submitting to the Lord. Of course, in thine own power is terminology that comes from the account in Acts chapter 5 of the sin of the husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira. 
they chose to lie, not only to the apostles, as Peter pointed out to both of them in time, but they chose to lie to God. They had chosen to sell land, take the money, as others were doing, and give it to the Lord. But they decided between themselves, it was deliberate, it was purposed, to say that they had given or they had, been, they had received for the land so much when that was not the amount they received because they were going to keep back part of it but tell that they were giving all of it. It's at this point that Peter says, while it was in thine own power, you could have done thus and so. Now let's just apply it immediately to the actual contribution of funds that we make to the church. It's in your power. As to how much monetarily you give to the Lord. God placed that in your power. He's letting you, according to your love of God, your knowledge of the Bible, your faith in God, your desire to further the work of Christ through the church, He's letting that be under your power to motivate you to give whatever it is you give. He tells us that we're to give cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. That we're to give as we've been prospered. But He allows us the power to determine the actual amount, if you want to put it this way, that we put in the plate. It allows, in His good wisdom, for each person, according to their own growth and develop spiritually, development spiritually, to give as they've been prospered. Remember, I've said several times, and not just because I said it, because it's just the case, that when you become a Christian, your past sins are forgiven, but now you're added to the Lord. You're a new creature in Christ. Behold, all thing, old things are passed away. All things become new. And we've resolved in our heart to live our lives under the authority of Christ and all that we think, say, and do. But everything God enjoins upon a member of the church, a Christian, a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, is that which we can get better in doing. We can grow in it. We're admonished over and over again in the Scriptures, one way or the other, to grow in the grace of knowledge. So it's obvious then that one can gain more knowledge and more understanding. And you have passages of Scripture that says, well, you people as Christians have not used the time you've had in searching after me, so you've lost what you had, and you have to go back and be taught again the fundamentals, such as the inspired comment to the Hebrews and the Hebrews epistle. All this has been placed by God Almighty in our own power. Even what He commands us to do, when we're doing it, there's room for growth and development when it has to do with what it takes for us to be faithful in Christ. So he said that to them because they deliberately chose to lie. Now, you know, if we didn't have that divine intervention by God through Peter to reveal this about them, who would have ever known, save those two in God, that they had lied about the amount of money that they had received the piece of land? No one would have known. Nevertheless, Peter, inspired of, the, of God, said it was in your power. No one forced you to do this. No one put pressure on you to act otherwise. You made the decision. Now, they may have put pressure on themselves. Well, let's be known as fine, upstanding, sacrificial Christians because we want them to think we gave all that we received for the land and yet we'll keep back part of it. Well, that's a bad disposition of heart. But who chose to have that disposition of heart? Did anybody force that upon them? Nobody but themselves. Thus they sinned and they died for our sins. And that ought to be enough to tell us how God thinks about matters like that. We're in control then of our possessions. And we can end up like the rich farmer who said, well, look what all I have. It's don't have enough to contain it. So I'll build bigger barns and fill them up. 
He never gave any thought about tomorrow, about eternity, about what could be done here or that. It's all I, mine, all that. And then the statement of our God, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Now that's something we have no power over as to when we're going to depart this world. Even if we are being treated for something and the medical science allows us to be treated of it, you still don't know what's going to kill you. When you're going to die. When the Lord will return. We just don't know. And we're admonished one way or the other. Be prepared every second of every minute of every day of every week. By being faithful. It's in my own power. Now, do you see why it's a bit scary? to Think about what's in my power. God Himself has placed it there. When you think of the widow who gave all she had, but didn't mount anything really as far as the way we look at it, it's less than the couple of cents we might have today. She gave her last mite, as it was called then. Yet Jesus stood over watching that contribution and said, that's greater than those who put in lots of money out of their abundance. Now what does that mean? Well, what does Jesus need with any money? I heard somebody describe it this way. A man steals a million dollars sent to jail. A man steals a brand new pencil. Well, to steal is to take something which does not belong to him from someone else. Now, the man that stole a million dollars, we get all beside that, but the pencil, we don't think that much about it. But for the person, each person who did the stealing, one just as big a thief in God's eyes as the other. It's because of their own disposition of heart. Their own attitude, in this case, of somebody else's possessions and God's will concerning how we deal with one another and doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. See, that's the reason that when you're rearing children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and one of them takes a little, I don't know what candy costs nowadays, but say a little penny if there is such a thing, piece of candy, and slips in a store and you go to leave and you notice he just reached up there and got him some, maybe. And he didn't think anything about it. Well, no big deal, is it? Just make him go put it back and let's go. Well, now you've missed your point to begin to train that conscience. Why don't you let him go back and give it back and then go to the person and apologize for taking it. And you begin to mold a conscience. You know why we have so many people today that you can call chronologically adults, but really they're about 14 years old, if they're that old. And there's more of them now than ever. And that's because the home's broken down. Everybody's allowed just to, like a bunch of chickens with nobody around. Little chickens running everywhere and nobody to take care of them. They have nobody. You know, even in the animal world, a lot of little animals, whatever they are, babies of some sort, they even learn how to do certain things from watching their mother. Do you realize that baby turkeys without a literal mother will starve to death? They don't know how to reach down and peck at something until they see something else pecking at it. They also are known in the big flocks to stand out in the middle of a deluge of water and a great thunderstorm and hold their heads up and drown. So when we start calling people dumb, you might think about dumb as a turkey. No wonder people have been called turkeys. That's pretty bad. You know, it takes, takes another light on when somebody calls you a turkey, just what an insult that is. So, in the whole animal kingdom, but we're far beyond that. People depend upon the examples of others for a lot of things. And the home is expected to supply not only good, wholesome teaching, but then just some good, plain, simple examples and direction. We come here with the ability to be embarrassed. You can embarrass a child very easily, just as well as you can scare it. Or go goo-goo and tickle it on the chin and it'll laugh. But it's like one preacher told me a long time ago when he said somebody asked him in one place, when is that child old enough for me to get that child's attention? He said, how old was he when he got your attention? 
did, did we, did, when our babies were born, were they total idiots? No, they're human beings. As a baby, that's the way they operate. Of course, now you realize whatever child I have and whatever grandchild I have, smartest things on earth. Until they get some years older and then we start thinking more about turkeys. We're in possession of so much that God has said, I'm putting it in their hands. Now, I'm not leaving it up to them just to do as they please with it. Neither was in that sapphire. This world in the flesh is a place to prepare to meet God and mold ourselves in the likeness of Christ. And thus the Philippians, Paul would say, let this mind of Christ be in you. Well, how do I do that? I have to determine to will myself to comply with the truth of God's will. Think about our souls. Our souls will spend eternity. Spend is not a good word talking about eternity, but it's the best we can do. Or we can say we'll be in eternity in either heaven or hell. Look around you. Let's just contain ourselves for teaching purposes of this room. Everybody in here is going to be in heaven or hell. It's all dependent on our realizing that our souls are in our own power. We have the power to accept, believe, and obey the grace of God that brings salvation to all men. As it came teaching, as Paul said to Titus, Titus 2, 11 and 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present age or world. That's the way we're to live. And the Bible gets pretty particular on a lot of things about how we think and what we say and what we do. Nobody can literally say somebody else made me do that. Not when it comes to salvation from sin. That's really a good, good many other things. Somebody said we slip into sin. I think over the years we just have to say, no, we line up marking the sin. We choose those areas that encourage us to break God's will rather than choose those areas that encourage us to obey the truth. And thus we, we march right off and end up to where Ananias and fire ended up. Think about that. The very presence of apostles possessed of miraculous powers and what they had seen in the early church. Just think of that. And yet, they got together as a husband and wife and decided to do that thing because they wanted the acclaim of having given all the money they received for the land. Peter says, well, you didn't have to do this. You didn't even have to tell that how much you got for the land. You could have given the money no one would have known one way or the other. Does that sound like they failed at the pride of life, the temptation, the vainglory of life? You know, Jesus said that you cannot serve God and mammon or the materialistic thing. Can't do it. You'll love one or hate the other, hate the one love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We can act to save our souls in only one way, through belief and obedience to the gospel of Christ and faithful living in the Lord's church. But we have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to. I don't believe that. You say, well, members of the church wouldn't do that. And I suffer right in the presence of the apostles of Christ and all they had seen miraculously. They did it. So obviously miracles being done doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do right, even when you behold it. So the choice is in thine own power. Our influence, the power we have over others by the way we live, whether it's good or bad. That's in our power. People ask, well, am I wrong in doing this? Am I wrong in doing that? Well, those choices, it's in our own power. We make the choice. Either leads us closer to the knowledge and practice of the truth and encourages us in living it, or it does the other. There's no middle ground. Do we influence others or for good or for bad? That's all according to our conduct and there's one question to everybody why choose people who don't love the Lord and in company with them as if they're your best buds as Ken likes to say 
Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, usually when you need to be optimistic, it's hard to be so. <laughs> when you maybe need to turn away and see your pessimism, it's hard to do that too. But it's in our own power as to how we do life. Look at Jesus in the garden. His humanity cried out, I don't want to go through with this. But he knew full well what had to be to make salvation possible to all men. And he even said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will for thine be done. We all have to reach that stage. Everybody that becomes a Christian has to reach that stage in their hearts. And as they live the Christian life, they have to reach that stage. It's God's will. He knows best. Does it hurt when you do it? Yes. But it's best. And so you simply, we used to say it this way, you knuckle down and do it. A lot of marriages either never happen or else they go on the rocks because people just won't knuckle down and do it. They don't recognize an obligation as a husband to the wife or the wife the same toward the husband. Things uh, don't just, you know, they don't find their prince charming and they right off and everything's nice ever after these things well the devil will see to that <laughs> that just won't happen you may not live in a situation where things are as bad in your life as other people I tell you there will be some bad times come along coming in every direction well you're going to give up on God because you're going through what everybody else <laughs> goes through that's lived understand the design and purpose of life in the flesh on earth and you'll take then the view more, as much as we can, as weak human beings that Christ had. And we'll strive to do it all our lives. And we'll grow in it. And that is learning to do God's will even when it hurts. Because He knows best. Paul said, when the Lord's strongest in my life is when I'm the weakest. Why is that? Because we tend to depend more on God when we can't help ourselves. And other people can't help us. Who's left? The work of the church is in our own power. We can add to or we can take from the influence of a congregation. We can attend Bible study or we can stay at home. We can attend the worship assemblies or we can stay at home. It's all in our power. Well, I'm just not able to be there. But you feel the same way the next day, and where are you able to be? I remember one time in country church where I preached. I think it was my second full-time work. Driving out on Saturday afternoon, there's a woman older than I am now. And she was bent over in her flower bed just working up a storm. But we got to church the next day. She just didn't feel like coming. Well, I realize she could have had a catastrophic whatever take place overnight. I understand that. But the truth of the matter is, most people who do things like that just don't equate attendance at church like she did the importance of weeding out that flower bed. They just don't. They can say what they want to say. People can try to apologize for them. They can this, that, and the other, but they don't. We can grow spiritually or not. And that means we can grow spiritually the only way one can, which is through proper knowledge and practice of the truth, or not. We can seek God's kingdom first or not. And if it's not first, it's last. We can save souls, a soul winner for Jesus. Did I hear that sung a little while ago? Well, you'd like to see people obey the gospel and remain faithful. But so many times those people don't have the same view of things you do. Don't even see the need of it. Have no guilt of sin. And the same is true of a lot of members. But the choice is in thine own power. You know, you can even make yourself more conscious and caring about a right thing. I've done this at other times. I'll do it now. You just answer in your own mind. Have you ever learned to eat something and, and like it or... Whatever, have you ever learned uh, to do something and that was needful and you didn't necessarily like it, but it was needful, so you did it. 
You ever think that's how you grow in the Lord's kingdom? You ever in your prayer say to God, I don't want to do this, but I know it's right. Help me to want to do it and help me to love it and help me to grow spiritually to do so. I don't think we pray that prayer nearly enough, but it shows God our concern for the work of the church, for the cause of Christ, for our desire to be like Christ. Of course, that means that our final destination, which we can follow the narrow way of truth or the broad way of do as you please. Matthew 7, 13 to 14, the Lord talked about that. It just simply means you can go to heaven or you can go to hell by your own choice. You know, some people say God says He's love, but I don't really think He is, or He would have made it where we wouldn't lose our soul. After all, He fathered our spirits. We have that imprint of deity upon us, so why would He give us a chance to be lost? Well, it's, doesn't that begin to tell you more about agape love? That God loved us enough to make us in such a way and put us in a place where we choose. Choose upon the proper disposition of mind toward God or toward this world. Or we don't. That is, we either choose heaven or we choose this earth and hell. Someone has said, life has but two ends. One has already been taken care of. You have the power to decide how the end will be whenever it comes and we don't know. God gave that to us because He loves us. The idea of love today, and you've heard me say it many times, is basically a, 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 a sick, syrupy sentimentalism. It's, but the love of the Bible is one that will cause us to do right no matter what, and if it hurts. All you got to do is think of Jesus to see what I mean by that. It'll make us give up things that we love and are pleasing to us for the cause of Christ, for the good of Christ. And once you become a Christian, you spend the rest of your life, however long or short that may be, learning to put that into practice. Learning to use time as God intended, to find God, to serve Him, to see His shortcomings, to get over them. Whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty, he being not forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. That's a lifelong process. So time continues, God giving us the opportunity to obey the gospel, live faithful, 2 Peter 3, 9, through the proper knowledge of the truth. But it's all in our own power. It's all in our own power. When you think about what pictures we have of the judgment, where people stand before Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body in Paul's words, whether good or bad, and you see then what Jesus gives us as a picture then you'll notice he never argues with anybody. I don't know whether anybody will have a chance to argue. They do come back and say, Lord, did we not do this and so and so and so in thy name? Uh, but he gives an answer. He doesn't argue. He just depart from me. I never knew you. And everlasting power is prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the end of it. I really think some people have so deceived themselves, they think they'll be able to argue themselves into heaven. They need at this stage to have more of the attitude of the demons we talked about this morning. They knew that what he said they would do, not because they wanted to or not, but because the power of his word sent them there. You ever go on uh, YouTube and watch some of these courts when they're sentencing some bad people, rapists and murderers? They've got some of them where they pull together the response of some of these people when they heard the sentence read. And I don't know why some of these folks that are so caught up in one view of the emotional view of love don't get all upset. Because some of those judges, you're talking about sounding right to the point. And they just lay the law down to them as to what you are. And some of them have even said, I'm giving you this sentence to the full extent of the law and I'd give you more if the law allowed. I don't know why somebody says, well, he doesn't love him. Justice doesn't look at it that way. Even the pure justice of the Almighty, that's infallible. You do wrong, you pay the price. You do good, you receive the reward. Who makes that choice? And it's scary. It's in my own power. If you're not a child of God this evening, we've studied how to become a Christian. As a child of God... Are you living rights in your own power? 
Do you need to repent? It's in your own power. Someday time will be over and things like this won't be. And we won't even have to think about an air conditioner. Now I say that facetiously, but that's how we are right now. That's how we're motivated by physical and earthly things. That such things are on our mind. All that's going to be erased. All that pertains to the way things work here and our appetites of the body are going to be gone. None of that will be there. The world passeth away, John says, and the lust thereof. I don't know what that will be like. It's all going to be taken away. So I want to be faithful by making the choice to obey God. Choose you this day whom you will serve. For me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let that be the resolve and let it stay right before you all the way through life, whether it's 40 years or 100. Heaven will be your home. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.